Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to be focusing on our last message in this Ezekiel series. Now, if you haven't been able to check out the rest of the series, I would encourage you kind of go back a few weeks, start at the beginning, work your way forward because there's a lot of stuff that culminates here in what we're talking about today. We're going to be focusing on chapters 40 to 48. It's a lot going on there. Um, but specifically for right now, for some of our Bible reading, I want to encourage you to turn with me to chapter 43. Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 to 5. Now, if you don't know where the book of Ezekiel is, in the beginning of your Bible, there is a table of contents, and I really want you to use it so you become more familiar with things. Ezekiel 43, verses 1 to 5. Here's what it says. Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like a roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city, like the visions I had seen at the Kibar River. And I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing the east, and then the Spirit lifted me up, brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Lord, as we're looking into your word, as we're looking into this final section on the book of Ezekiel, uh, Lord, that you will help us to have some discernment, help us to have eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that are open to uh, what you have for us at this point. And Lord God, also that, that we would be willing to be able to wrestle through some questions that we may not, in fact, actually have easy answers to. In your name I pray. Amen. So in Ezekiel 40 to 48... Uh, Ezekiel sees this detailed vision of this immense and glorious temple. The, this lengthy vision has been the subject of an awful lot of speculation uh, and, and a lot of various interpretations throughout the years. And so this is not an easy section in Scripture. It's actually a section that, um, that you could probably find a, a, some amount of confusion in. So the goal for today is to give a baseline of how to look at this particular section of Scripture, and, and I'll give you some insight in terms of where I'm coming from when looking at it, and then hopefully that can help you in your own journey with it. Now in Ezekiel uh, chapters 8 to 11, uh, the prophet sees the glory of God leaving the temple. Now we've talked about that in the past, and the idea of God leaving the temple is a really significant thing because for Israel, this was God's dwelling place. This is where they came to interact with God. And so for God to leave the temple, for them meant God left them. Now, the beauty in that part of the story is that we see that God, in approaching Ezekiel, who is in Babylon, it is God is on the move and he comes to his people anyway. But the idea of God leaving the temple is a very significant spiritual uh, statement. In exile, he encouraged Israel that judgment wouldn't last forever but that God would restore Israel once again to live among them. And now this is a really uh, amazing thing at this point as well. And the reason we say that is because uh, Israel is coming through a time where it's just been decimated. They've been ridiculed by the neighboring nations, their enemies, and, and they feel as though God has just, uh, just crushed them. And, and, and they have nothing left that they can count on. The things they used to count on, they can't count on anymore. And the only thing they have left now is the Lord himself. And so in chapters 40 to 48, this is the 25th year of Israel's captivity. So 25 years they're experiencing all of this. And here we find Ezekiel describing this enormous new temple in chapters 40 to 42. The glory of God returning in chapter 43. The sacrifices being resumed. So their, their way of worship being resumed in chapters 44 to 46. The land is restored to the people of Israel in 47 to 48. And the Gentiles have a place in this restored kingdom in Ezekiel 47 verse 22. And so in this, what you find is some pieces that come along with what it means to be the people of God and to experience the blessings of God. God says that you will be my people, I will be your God. And so he returns and in his returning, you see this taking place. He is their God. He dwells with them. They worship Him. The sacrifices are resumed. And so there's this, um, this, this reorienting of Israel, but this reunification of that relationship between Israel and God, uh, even though God was always in relationship to Israel. You see the land restored to the people of Israel. And so this is one of the promises, right, that you will receive land, that 
um, that you're going to be this great nation and that you're going to be a blessing to others. And so even in the you're going to be a blessing to others, the idea that the Gentiles have a place in the restored kingdom is this blessing towards the world on be, coming through Israel. So really neat stuff taking place there. And the other thing that comes along with this in Ezekiel 44, at chapter 3 and chapter um, 34, we see that this land is going to be ruled by a Davidic king or a Davidic prince rather. That is what's taking place in these chapters. So you can well imagine there's a lot to cover. And so we're going to look at this from a 50,000 foot view rather than a 10,000 foot view. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of things so that you have some tools to walk deeper into your own study. Now, when we talk about this particular passage of scripture, there's something that comes up that we have no choice but to address. And that is something called the millennium. Now, the millennium, we're not talking Star Wars, not the Millennium Falcon or anything else like that. Though that could be fun too. Um, but we're talking about the 1,000 year reign of Jesus that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. Now, not a lot of people know this. Or maybe that's not true. In the event that you don't know this, Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 have a tremendous amount to do with not only the encouragement of Israel, but talking about end time prophecy and, and, and talking about what, what the worship of God looks like and what the connection with God looks like in the end of days. And so this is what brings us to that 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus mentioned in Revelation 20. Now this passage is notoriously difficult to interpret. And it's been the source of debate uh, uh, for a long, long time. And it really comes down to three schools of, th of thought as it relates to the millennium. The, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus. You have what you would call the amillennialists and, and millennialists. And, and I should qualify before going further. Every single one of these views are held by people who love the Lord, who love the scriptures, but they're coming out on different conclusions based on some of these prophetic passages, um, which to me then says, okay, so then all of us, if whatever camp we find ourselves in, we just got to make sure that that camp doesn't become the point for us, but the fact that Jesus reigns becomes the point for us. So the amillennialists, they don't actually expect this future literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus. As a matter of fact, they would say that Christ's reign with his saints uh, during that time between his first coming and his second coming. That that all of it is the reign of Jesus. Uh, so that would be the millennium. And of course, we know that it's been over a thousand years. And so then I imagine for them that it becomes a little bit more figurative than literalist when it comes to those kinds of things. So the Amillennials do not believe in a literal 1,000 year reign, but rather that time period between when Christ came and when he returns. You have then also what you would call the post-millennialists. Post-millennialists believe that Jesus will return after the millennium as a golden age when most of the world is converted to Christianity. And so the millennium for them is the idea that uh, the world is going to progressively get better because of the gospel. And, and then there is going to be when, when this golden age hits, this is going to be the millennial reign of Jesus. And then you have the premillennialists. Uh, they believe that Jesus returns before the millennium. Um, and it's preceded by a period of an intense tribulation. So the premillennial people believe in, in Jesus returning uh, for the rapture of his church uh, before the 1,000 year reign. So he raptures his church up uh, and, and that there is this great tribulation that takes place. This is what's going on. These are the different kinds of things that people are bringing to the table when you look at something like Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Because these passages, though they are in a direct encouragement to Israel at the time, they're also a statement to future states uh, that we look at when we're considering the end of days. So in his vision of the temple, Ezekiel is taken to Israel where he sees this mountain and a city. And he's met by, in Ezekiel chapter 40 verse 3, he's met by a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. Now this, this guy... He tells Ezekiel to pay careful attention to everything he sees and hears and relate those things to, uh, to, in detail to God's people. And this is verse 4. And the measuring and the laying out of the temple complex fills really the next three chapters. This tremendous detail that's going on. 
It is essentially this verbal blueprint that God, that this guy is giving to Ezekiel to write down and then to deliver to others. And the question then that we deal with with this one is, when and how will this vision of Ezekiel's temple be fulfilled? That becomes the question here. And this is where the debate emerges. Because you have questions like, well, has it already been fulfilled? Or is the fulfillment still in the future? Uh, should we look for a literal fulfillment? Or is this vision symbolic of this future per perfection of God's presence among his people? Did the prophecy fail? That's another question that comes up. And if Ezekiel's temple is in the future, will it be fulfilled in the church age, the millennium, or in the eternal state? So there's all kinds of questions that come along with this. So you can well imagine that over the years there's been much debate. Uh, and the neat thing about it is that we get to benefit from other godly people who have entered into that debate, had great questions going back and forth, loving Jesus, loving the Word of God, and we get to wrestle with it uh, off their shoulders, so to speak. So the answer to these questions are going to be determined most likely by the presuppositions that we bring um, to the table regarding things like literal versus symbolic nature of the writing, uh, symbolic nature of the prophecy and the fulfillment. So if you're a person who says, yeah, most of the prophecies, these are just symbolic things, well, then you're likely going to approach this vision of the temple in a symbolic manner. And if you believe that these are literal, you're going to probably approach it in a literal manner. The difficult section of this scripture that we have here um, is difficult for a variety of reasons, but one of them is just it's actually just kind of hard to understand sometimes. There's different ways in which people have tried to understand it, and a lot of genuine believers uh, have come out with opinions on this particular passage which are different from each other's opinions. Sometimes my opinions are different from theirs, theirs are different from mine, and, and so where we land... Um, we just got to stress that, that where we land can't be the point. And we can have these conversations, but if there are different understandings of the passages based on a, a good hermeneutic, meaning a, a good way of interpreting the Word of God, and we're honoring the Lord, and we, you know, in, in all of this and honoring each other, then one of the things we have to recognize is that that is the reason that there is debate. That's the reason why we search over the Scriptures and we push and pull and we have this iron sharpening iron with each other. So there's many ways, and there's genuine believers who have tried to deal with this. So let's, let's look at four main ideas that really come out of this. When you're looking at the, the temple language that you find in chapters 40 to 48, there are four main ideas that really emerge in terms of things that we need to wrestle with. Now, the first one would be this. Is this history or is this future? And it's one of the things to, to deal with. Some people have tried to argue that this temple has already existed in the past. And they say that this temple is one of the earlier three temples. Those ones being the Temple of Solomon, which you're probably familiar with. There's Zerubbabel's temple, and then there's Herod's temple. And Zerubbabel's temple, we don't really uh, talk about very much. We talk about Solomon's temple. We talk about Herod's temple. But the size and the design of this new temple is very different than these other three temples. And so if we're saying that it is a historical thing, that these, this is a temple that is one of the ones that have existed in the past, but it doesn't, it is not described, it's not detailed in the same way that these other ones are. It gives you the notion, that, of course, that these are different temples. There's never been a temple that was like this one that we find in chapters 40 to 42. The, there's a river that flows from the temple in chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. No river has flowed from any of the previous temples, not one. So it's most likely that this new temple must be for a future time. Because it's not being described by any of the previous temples, it must mean that, okay, this temple hasn't existed yet, there's this river flowing through it, the dimensions are different, uh, it's got to be a different temple, it's likely a temple from the future. The style of worship is similar to what you would find in the Old Testament within this temple. This is chapters 43 to 46, but it's not the same. There are differences in there when you compare how worship was to take place. So there's never been worship quite like this in the past, and therefore the worship style must also then be something of the future. And the 12 tribes will have equal shares in the land. Chapters 45, 47, 48. And this has not happened in the past, and it's not happened today. 
the geography of the region will have to change before this can happen. And so therefore, the division of the land must also be in the future. So is this history or is this future? And I would suggest to you that uh, although that there's, there's solid and, and, and faithful men and women of the Lord that are trying to suggest that it's historical, um, I, I think the scripture itself lends itself more likely to it being of a future state. And that is the predominant view, I should tell you. Um, but it, it seems to be the most legitimate view in relation to actually studying the Word. Another one we have to look at is, is this allegory or is this is actual? Is it symbolic or is it real? And some people don't believe that there will be a new temple. They can't see why there would be any sacrifices after death, the death of Jesus, which is a really legitimate question. What do we do with this language in Ezekiel's temple, recognizing that it's for a future state, but there's sacrifices in it, and we had the death of Jesus? Like, what do we do with all of this? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But the people who do believe this believe that the passage is either, um, well, like I said, symbolic. It's, it's picture language or allegory. And so they interpret it in a variety of different ways, even in the mix, the allegory. Some people believe that these are just symbols of worship. Some people believe that it's a symbol of the heavenly state. In other words, that final state in glory in heaven as a symbol. Some people say that it's a symbol of the growth and development of the church. And yet some others believe that Ezekiel's hope, this was Ezekiel's hope for rebuilding the temple in its return to Jerusalem. So even in amidst those who believe that this is more of a picture language, more allegory, more symbolic, the idea here is still, even within that line of thinking, there are still deviations from each other in terms of what one believes about the temple. The other one here that I want to suggest is, is uh, which is also a legitimate question that you have to apply to the text, and that is, did this prophecy fail? Did it fail? Some people say that the prophecy failed, and in their opinion, it was for the Israelites who returned from exile, and if they obeyed God fully, they would have experienced having this particular temple. It would have happened. But Ezekiel, and this is really important, Ezekiel doesn't actually make the fulfillment of this prophecy dependent on the faithfulness of the people. So this prophecy is independent of the people. People are impacted by it. They're indirectly uh, involved, but it is a direct action of a command from God to have this temple not dependent on the actions of the people. And so the word of God does not fail. Prophecy, if it's from God, it will happen. And given that it hasn't happened yet, we can anticipate it happening in the future. So I believe that there will be a new temple. Absolutely. I believe there will be a new temple, that it's not a thing of the past. I do not believe that it's allegorical. Uh, I believe that there will be a legitimate, real temple of the Lord. And then we have this idea of, okay, so even if we believe that it's a future thing, do we believe that it's, a, it's the final eternal state or do we believe that this is part of the millennial reign of Jesus? And, and, and so both of them being in the future, but which is the one that we would land on in terms of what we think this temple is actually representing? Now, some people say that the vision shows the eternal state. And the eternal state is, is the idea of the new heaven, new earth. But this vision can't be of the eternal state. For example, in the new earth, there is no temple. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 then the river will flow from the throne in chapters 22, verse 21. So in Ezekiel's vision, the river flows from the temple. So you got it from the throne or from the temple. And so there's something different taking place here. We believe that it's most likely time for this prophet, the most likely time for this prophecy is actually during the millennial reign of Jesus. Now, can I prove that 100%? I will promise you right here now, no, I can't. This is where I lean. But it's important that you know where everybody else leans uh, on some of these things as well, because there are different views. The millennial is the 1,000 year reign of Jesus, where he will rule on the earth. This is Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And this is before this earth ends, before the start of the new earth in chapter 21, verse 1 of the book of Revelation. Now, several approaches have been put forward regarding how Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 should be understood. And beyond providing hope for the immediate audience of the Judeans that were in exile. The prophet's words are foundational for the development of the storyline of Scripture. And what we find then is that there are some comparative studies, some parallels that we can make. 
the mode of the Apostle John's vision of Revelation parallels that of Ezekiel's vision of the temple. Ezekiel stated that this prophetic vision of the future restoration of Israel began when God took him on a very high mountain, the southern slope of which housed what resembled a city. This is chapter 40, verse 2. When he later describes this new temple, he states that the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Chapter 43, verse 5. So the prophet's experience echoes John's experience, or John's experience echoed the prophet's, Ezekiel's experience. Because he wrote that at the conclusion of his prophetic apocalyptic vision, an angel carried him away in the Spirit to a high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Revelation 21, verse 10 to 11. Now Ezekiel noted that the voice speaking to him sounded like a roar of mighty waters in chapter 43, verse 2. Like the voice of the risen Christ who spoke to John on the outset of his vision in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. And so there are these immense parallels that it's like, hey, you guys are talking about some of the same stuff here. Ezekiel's vision of the new temple was echoed in the New Jerusalem. Ezekiel noted that his vision, uh, the vision that he saw an angelic feature, uh, figure employ a measuring rod to account for the size of the temple. Chapter 40, verse 3. John's vision of a New Jerusalem can included something very similar. He recorded that the angelic figure guided his, that guided his prophetic vision had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Revelation 21, verse 15. In Ezekiel 45 and in chapter 48, Ezekiel notes that the section of the promised land belonging to the Lord was cube-shaped. And in the same way, the outer walls of the new temple complex would resemble a cube. Chapter 42. And these geometrical configurations were perhaps meant to reflect the Holy of Holies? Maybe? We get this idea potentially from uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, 2 Chronicles chapter 3. And, and John the Apostle stated that the new heavenly Jerusalem was also a cube. Revelation 21, 16, The city was laid out like a square. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stata, stadia, in length, as wide, as high as it is long. So it's this big cube. The Lord told Ezekiel concerning the new temple. Ezekiel 43, verse 7, he said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. The people of Israel will never again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their prostitution and funeral offerings for their kings at their death. So the prophet understood that the entire city of the New Jerusalem would be called Yahweh is there. God is present. It's not surprising then that John's vision would be described, would be describing the reality of God's presence in Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God will himself will be with them and be their God. So in Ezekiel 47, verse 1 and 7, and verse 12, the prophet describes this river flowing eastward from underneath the temple with many trees lining the river, each bearing seasonal fruit, neither withering and never withering. And again, John's vision mirrors Ezekiel's, but with a very significant difference. He wrote what he saw. The river of living water sparkled like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down in the middle of the broad street of the city, on both sides of the river was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. And so they're slightly different from each other, but they parallel. Ezekiel prophesied that sacrifices would be central in the temple, in Israel's temple. In Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 18, Ezekiel heard the word of the Lord concerning that construction of the altar where the burnt offerings were to be sacrificed and the blood was to be sprinkled. And the author of Hebrews detailed the heavenly tabernacle where Christ's blood was sprinkled in chapter 9, verse 11 to 22, the book of Hebrews. And the temple of Ezekiel's vision would be the place where Israel would offer continual and regular sacrifice. But the author of Hebrews notes that the new heavenly tabernacle 
enjoyed only one sacrifice, saying in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he sacrificed himself. And so what we know then is that Jesus made the one complete and perfect sacrifice for sin. He died once for all time because of our sin. There is now no need for any other sacrifices. There is now no need for human priests. But in this prophecy that Ezekiel is dealing with, there are sacrifices for sin and there are human priests. So what do we do with this? How do we handle this? And it seems to me that the best explanation that we have is that the temple, the sacrifices, and the priests are for Israel. During the millennium, people from other nations will worship with them in Jerusalem. We read that in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Ezekiel's vision shows a perfect practice of Israelite worship. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices refer forward to the Messiah. In the millennium, the sacrifices refer backward to the death of the Messiah. This is probably one of the best explanations, I think, that we can come across for figuring out what to do with this. The sacrifices never could take away the sins, ever. In the millennium, the sacrifices also will not take away sin. The sacrifices will remind people about the one sacrifice that Jesus, the Messiah, made. And that was the only sacrifice that actually dealt with sin. Now, in a similar way, uh, Christians break bread and drink wine, and the bread and the wine represent their signs of the body and the blood of Christ, who is the Messiah. And this act is referring to the death of Christ. And so the animals and the sacrifices represent the work of the Messiah for Israel. And that work is complete. He died for us and he rose again from the dead. Now, whatever way a person interacts with this text, it's important for us to know that the vision of Ezekiel's temple says that God has not forsaken his people. I want you to hear that. This is important. Regardless of the circumstances, all throughout human history, all throughout the history of the text, and when you look at both Old and New Testaments, God has never forsaken his people. He may discipline us, but it tells us in the Word that, that, that he disciplines those whom he loves, and that if we're not disciplined by the Lord, that we're illegitimate sons and daughters. And so the fact that he disciplines us is a good thing, which is why we're to view hardship as discipline. But God has never forsaken his people. Second thing would be this. God will restore relationship with them. He will restore relationship with them. And then thirdly, the restoration will be elevated to its original intent. Ezekiel's future vision of the temple, John's vision of this new Jerusalem, it is this language of God walking in harmony with his people. Adam and Eve enjoyed a relationship with God and with each other that was unhindered by the disruptive power of sin. And that's what God is bringing us to. And so when we look at this end time stuff and we see all these different theories coming along, this is the point. That God restores relationship perfectly without the disruption of sin. And we are once again walking with the Lord. So if I can encourage you with this, in the same way that Ezekiel encourages the, uh, the Judeans, and in the same way that John encourages the churches, our circumstances should not cause us to doubt God's promises. God's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. Nothing can separate you from His love, which is in Christ Jesus, and He is going to return. That's where we place our hope, not in our circumstances because He is above them and He can raise us above them. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank You so much for our time and I pray, Lord, that in this overview of this end time uh, passages, Lord, that we were able to look at today, I ask, Lord, that it would be a starting place for people to go deeper, to understand You more, and to live more faithfully for You. In Your name I pray. Amen.